Hello, and welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast, the podcast where we get together as alpha males, making godly men strong and strong men godly. Today is going to be a deep philosophical kind of discussion. So if you want to reason together with me, men, and be circumspect, perhaps you'll like to do that today. I'm going to plug in the bio, and then we'll get into the main topic. Before I put in the bio, don't forget about GoodShepherdTraining.com. If you want more, to be a more active member of the audience, to support GoodShepherdTraining.com. You shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Who am I? A question we should all ask ourselves. I am, first and foremost, a servant of God, made in his very own image, a follower of Jesus Christ, a simple man called by God to the Great Commission to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Next, a little bit about my background and what God has allowed me to do and blessed me to do in life. Grew up what most would consider very poor in the backwoods of the southeastern and mid-Atlantic United States. Hunting and fishing. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. So a decorated Marine Corps combat veteran. Infantry assaultman. After the combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also a veteran of law enforcement. I served... With LAPD, I was a sworn peace officer, a cop for LAPD. I worked regular patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. One of those more specialized assignments was warrant service, fugitive recovery. Also had some other law enforcement roles. I am an FBI certified firearms instructor and been certified by another three-letter government agency and a lot of firearms and training things. I've also been a private contractor, worked in the private sector, pertaining to tactics and gunfighting and protecting America from enemies foreign and domestic. I served as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters in a large metropolitan area. That was our primary mission, to stop active shooters, which sadly are a thing in America today. I've also been blessed to do quite a bit of competition shooting. Started my first formal competitions even before joining the Marine Corps at 17. I had one more shooting competitions than I can remember. I have competed in all manner of disciplines in shooting, I've been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion, West Coast regional champion. Like I said, been blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. Mentioned hunting. I've hunted to put meat on the table starting when I was a child. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide, hunting and slaying all manner of beast. And I don't apologize for that. Humbled to be the host of three podcasts. Simple Man Sermons, Alpha Male Podcast, and Gumfighter Life. Obviously, as things not mentioned, I've been blessed to do many other things. But, again, first and foremost, I'm a servant. A servant of God, a believer and follower of the Bible, the Word, Jesus Christ. And I don't apologize for that. With that, Let's transition into today's topic. Several days ago, I was reasoning with myself, and hopefully you'll reason with me today. 
Why are cities liberal? Let that marinate in your brain for a little bit. Why are cities liberal? And of course, cities aren't liberal. Cities are collections of buildings and infrastructure. We personify that. We give it human characteristics because of the human beings that live in these cities. It's a human thing whether we say liberal or conservative. So I guess that question really is why are people in cities more liberal than people tend to be out in the country? And I know I'm speaking in generalities. You could find super conservative people in downtown San Francisco. I'm sure you could find super liberal people on a farm somewhere in Montana. We're talking in generalities. I'm not talking about judging individuals. Individuals ought to be judged by God. There is one judge. But hopefully we can talk about these generalities today without judging individuals. And first, I want to say for this discussion, so that you can think soberly and clearly, Let's table for this discussion. Let's set aside whatever your beliefs are on liberalism being good or bad or conservatism being good or bad. Start calling the left and liberals Nazis and the liberal left-leaning people start calling the right Nazis. That's not really helping and it's not going to help in this discussion because it might cloud your judgment. So if you can, you can pick up your beliefs, whatever they are, on the way out. But for this discussion, let's table that. Let's think of it in the abstract. Let's let's step back. If we were to say, go to a different topic and say that, in general, darker berries, blueberries, blackberries are native to colder climates. And things like the dark purple cabbage are native to colder climates. That's, look that up and verify that by the testimony of two or three witnesses a matter is established. Well, let's say that that's true. Find darker berries, darker vegetation in colder climates. And we step back and say, okay, warmer climates produce brighter colored fruit or lighter colored vegetation. And colder climates may produce darker fruit, darker leafy greens. Why might that be? Do those two environments produce those different things? Again, that's a generality. You can find light colored berries in cold climates. But we know by stepping back and looking at it that God made everything and he made dark colors attract heat. So it would make sense that something growing in a colder climate would attract heat. You know, a blueberry is a cold weather in general. We've made them to grow in other climates, but they come from colder climates. If a berry is darker, it attracts more heat. It may freeze less. It may postpone that freezing thaw cycle, things like that, which may help it in those colder environments. With a native blackberry from Scandinavia or something, it's black might help stave off that frost or that snow. That's a clear thing of why do we find these darker berries in colder climates? Okay, you may be thinking, who cares about berries? Well, my wife does. She's super into jam and berry collecting and berry making. We have more jam than I could even guess how many jars we have right now. We've been out foraging. But anyway, what does that have to do with liberals found in cities? Those two different environments produce in general, one will produce a darker berry. So if we apply that to cities and rural areas, if we take it on face value, and maybe you don't, but say you do. Let's say in general, cities tend to be more liberal and the country tends to be more conservative. Why? It's a good thing to do as an alpha male. That's a good alpha male skill. Why is that thing the way that it is? Just, oh, cities are bad, liberals are bad. I just did a big stint living in the wilderness, off-grid. But it doesn't do any good to jump in and be like, cities are bad, liberals are bad, liberal cities bad, bad, Nazi. Like, step back, take a deep breath. Why? Why are cities liberal? Why do liberal people tend to be in cities? Why is this the way that it is? Because we tend to see this, you know, You see this in San Francisco, you see this in New York, but you also see it in like Texas. The bigger urban areas tend to be more liberal than out in the country, the rural areas. You may think that California is super liberal, but it's not. The big city centers, you know, 
pretty much one big city from the Mexican border, you know, San Diego up through LA and Santa Clarita. It's all pretty much one big homogenous city at this point. And then you get the Bay Area. You get out in the country, in the ranching country, in the farming country, it tends to be more conservative. You also see a similar thing in Texas, which is known for being a conservative state, but the Judging on that scale, the cities in that state, you know, San Antonio, Austin, things like that, would tend to be more liberal than out in the country. Likewise, let's say Wyoming. If you're going to find liberals concentrated anywhere in Wyoming, it's probably going to be in Jackson Hole. Why, why is that? First off, and I, I was reasoning with myself and realized that it's good to ask questions even if you don't get an answer. God gave you a brain and reason. Use it. So, is this a cause or is this an effect? Do cities produce liberals? Now, cities don't really produce anything. We'll talk about that later. They're more of a consumer. But do cities produce liberals? Question mark. Or do cities attract liberals? So... Liberals being found in cities, is this a cause or an effect? It's a good place to start in understanding why. Why are cities liberal? Is it a cause or is it an effect? Again, maybe pause the podcast and think about that. Maybe think about it for a day and unpause the podcast if you want. A lot of times when I do a podcast episode, I will take no notes or I may have a couple of bullet points. I have three pages of notes scribbled down in one of those black and white composite things. And I thought about this for days. Now, this was posted in the Patreon chat long before you guys are aware of it, long before it's going to post. And I'm recording this in the year of our Lord, 2022, on the ninth day of the ninth month. But the Patreons had this a little bit ahead of time. I asked them, I said, you know, I've been thinking about this. Do you guys have any answers, any theories? And one that came up was, you know, younger people in cities. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I was any more liberal when I was younger. I certainly wasn't the man that I am today. I don't know that I would have called myself liberal when I was younger. I don't know that anybody that knew me then would have called me that. And I asked those patrons, were you more liberal when you were younger? didn't get a, really a consensus on that so it's a theory it certainly i was attracted to cities when i was younger you know i grew up in a very very rural area in the south and i did move to an urban area when i was younger when i got out of the marine corps wouldn't count my time in the marine corps because they were stationed wherever they're stationed that's not really based on your beliefs but when i got out i chose to go to work for lapd for a lot of reasons but I think the excitement of a big city when you're younger and being a cop in a big city attracted me. I do think that cities may attract quite a few younger people. But I don't know that that is the answer. I don't know that that's why cities are liberal. But it's a good theory, so I, I figured I'd post it. Somebody cared enough in the inner group of the Patreon chat to propose that idea, that hypothesis. Again, I'm not saying I have answers. I'm saying we should reason about this, better understand the situation that we're in. Another thing posted was that, you know, liberal education in the cities. Okay. That may even be part of it. And that made me broaden this question, broaden thinking about this. There's probably no denying that most universities are fairly liberal. Are most of those universities found in big urban areas? Some are. Some are found in much smaller towns now. And I think we could agree that a lot of educators are probably liberal. But that's a whole other question of why that is the way that it is. Well, let's stick to cities being liberal. So, this is obviously the case in America in 2022. And I'd submit it's been the case for several decades that cities are liberal. Let's take a step back. Let's... Look at the matter more broadly. Is this the case in the rest of the world? I don't know about a lot of other cultures and what you know. somebody in India may or may not recognize as liberal or conservative. I have no idea. I'm not acquainted enough with that culture to speak even remotely intelligently on that matter. So look at Western culture, places like Australia and 
England. And as far as I know, it's a similar phenomena there. I would imagine the rural cattle country and ranches of Australia tend to be pretty conservative. The big cities tend to be more liberal. Now let's go broader still, because that doesn't help us answer the question. Is this the way that it's always been? Say, going back. Let's look at it throughout history. Stick to the Western, because again, I don't, I don't know how I would define Chinese culture or something like that. I, again, I don't have enough. I have traveled, been blessed to travel quite a bit in this world, but I don't pretend to understand those cultures very well. Why? Why is this so, and has this been so for a long time? What about ancient Rome, Babylon, Baghdad, those cultures? Let's step back a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand years. Are cities always liberal? Do cities always produce liberals? And I, I don't think that that's the case. I, I don't think so. So we kind of have, in my opinion, somewhat, in my thought process, somewhat of an answer here. I don't think that cities always are more liberal. You know, back at the time of the revolution, a lot of the founding fathers were not only, some were older men, but some were quite young. I believe the, from the quick research that I did, the youngest man to sign the constitution was 26. And a lot of those men came from like Philadelphia and places like that, big urban areas for the time. So I don't think that the cities have always been liberal in this country or in other western places. So I don't think it is carte blanche de facto that cities are liberal. So bam, we got something there, right? We're on to something. If you take that reasoning at face value, and please don't. Please do your own research. I like history. I consider myself a student of history. I like to learn from it. But I don't know nothing about no fancy college degree. I ain't got no masters in theology or history. So do your own research on that. I don't put much stock in a college degree. Even though I get free college because I'm a veteran, I still think it's overpriced to go to college. Sometimes I'll go for fun to take a course and I'll... I've always gotten an A in whatever I took. still don't see the value in a college degree. It's a piece of paper and I don't think it makes me any smarter. But... A lot of jobs, you need that. You know, if you're going to be a surgeon, probably should have a college degree, at least right now. Anyway, where was I? I think we may have reasoned into cities have not always been liberal. They've not always either produced liberals or liberals have not always flocked to cities. And I started thinking about cities and culture and societies and culture throughout history. And cities have always kind of been, I believe, the cultural center of that culture. The trendsetters of fashion, of culture, of whatever that culture as a whole values, it tends to be concentrated in the city. I think this has been the case going back a long way, even pre-revolution. Look at fashion starting in Paris and London. We think it's fashion is like some new thing, but it's not. One of the first industries in North America was the fur trade, and especially beaver fur. A big part of that was because those beaver fur hats were in fashion in London and in Europe. Trickled out all the way to frontiersmen with tomahawks and going on long hunts out in the wilderness, in the modest parts of the frontier because of the culture and the cultural nucleus that was in London and Paris and things like that at the time. Ambergris, which if you don't know is a thing that comes from a whale. Likewise, whale oil. If you don't know, that's pretty much what they harvested whales for. For the cities and for the lamps. Now they used it in the country too, but especially the cities to light the lamps and really a big part of the Industrial Revolution. Again, in the cities, in those city centers. Whale oil, and especially starting with what got the train of thought going, Ambergris. That's used in perfumes. So your high-end cities in London and Paris and things like that want ambergris. And you have men on the high seas risking their lives, shoving harpoons into giant beasts of the ocean and far-flung areas of the world to haul it back to cities. 
because that's what the cities value. It is the epicenter. It is the nucleus of that culture. Whatever that culture values or whatever that culture is, is magnified in the city. Because a city is just a gathering of people, right? It's an ecclesia of, of people brought together. Just as in modern day, lots of people move to the city from lots of different areas. Whatever that culture tends to value is generally magnified in that city. Whatever you see in a big city tends to trickle out into the country. And you can wrestle with that, but that tends to be the case. In the 80s... You might see somebody with purple hair and a nose ring in London, in New York City. Right, they were around in the 80s, but in the big cities. Now, you might see a checkout person in a small town with purple hair and a nose ring. This has been, that was in the cities 20 years ago. And the exception proves the rule, they say. Very seldomly to something like fashion or whatever. Start out in the country. Blue jeans would be an example made for, you know, frontiersmen and miners and cowboys originally. And uh, kind of everybody adopted them. Usually fashion, Paris, Rome, London. And then trickles out into the hinterlands, right? The surrounding areas. Like we talked about, you know, purple hair and a nose ring. That was not uncommon super common but it wasn't crazy to see in a big city in new york and london in the 80s the quintessential punk right but now again you see that at a checkout counter in very rural towns you might see that for a barista in a very small town with colored hair and a nose ring and i'm not judging again let's table whether that's good or bad it just is right it started out in the cities and it trickled out into the hinterlands Likewise, you know, girls with tattoos. You might have seen a girl with a tattoo in a bigger city a couple of decades ago. Now, or maybe a sailor or something like that, they've typically always had tattoos. Military, been that way for a while. Generally, your general civilian probably weren't going to see a woman with a visible tattoo in a small town or in the country even a decade ago. Now it's very common to see a woman with a tattoo on her forearm or I think, what was it, in the 90s, early 2000s, they started getting them in the small of their back. No doubt that started out in a city first. Probably wasn't a lot of cowgirls on cattle farms getting tattoos on their back first. Probably started out in a city. And it became more common in cities, more common in cities, and then maybe a little bit smaller cities, and then towns, and then the country. So... I think the case can pretty clearly be made that a city, especially certain cities in certain countries, the city centers are the cultural centers. And we kind of see whatever way that culture is going or trending. I kind of use that word haphazardly, but we even see that today with the word trending, like what's trending. That's generally what's trending in the population, and most of the population nowadays is in big cities. There was a time, at least in America, where the majority of the population did not live in cities. Now, by far, the majority of the population does live in cities. Which, like it or not, means that the country is becoming more liberal. And you, can, you could not like that, but you really can't argue the fact that this country is more liberal today than it was in 1955. Right? I mean, I don't think anybody would, whether they like it or not, would make that case. Like, I don't like the fact that gas is way more today than it was in 1955, but you're not going to make the case. That's a bad thing. I don't like that gas costs me far more money. But you're not going to make the case that gas is not more expensive or the U.S. dollar doesn't buy less today than it did in 1955. Like it or not. For parallels, I will say that you do see cities becoming liberal in other societies, I would submit. Ancient Rome, ancient Babylon... And again, do your own research by the testimony of two or three witnesses a matter is established. But I've heard they complained about, you know, high-paid pop singers with certain innuendos and celebrity chefs and super highly paid athletes and things like that. You think of that as something new? It's, it's not new. They had it in ancient Rome, I do believe. They had it in ancient Babylon. And I wasn't there, so I didn't witness it with my own eyes. But from the writings and things that I know, this is not a new thing. So you do see cities becoming liberal in aging empires. So, there's that. So, we've stumbled on something. This is not unique to us right now. 
It's not something crazy in history. This has happened. So, are cities being liberal a cause or an effect? Perhaps they're just an easier reflection, a better, more clear mirror of the culture as a whole, which way it's turning, which way it's going. So maybe pause and think about that. Some other thoughts. It's good to go to God and reason. It's good to reason with oneself and be sober-minded and be circumspect. It's also good to reason with others. So I'm going to give some thoughts and things to think about. As I said, if you don't keep up with Alpha Male, if this is your first time listening, I live semi-nomadically and off-grid a lot of the times. Off-grid is a sliding scale. I recently got done with a long stint of like staying literally in the woods of the Pacific Northwest. No grid power, no running water, no cell phone signal for quite a while. And I gotta be honest, I really like that. But as my wife, my loving wife, tells me from time to time, you know, you may have been out in the woods too long. And she's probably right. I get a little bit too wild, a little bit too savage. Packing the meat off a deer carcass and eating it raw or just bathing in a creek or a mountain stream. As much as I enjoy that, if I'm called to be a preacher and a teacher, to be in contact with the world, and most of the world lives in cities. Now I'm close to, I'm not in, but I'm close to what I would consider a big city, like 10,000 people. To me, that's a big city when you go from bathing in a creek and not knowing where the next human being is. I started thinking about the difference between living in the woods, in the wilderness, off-grid, to living in a city. One of the first things, and you may laugh at this, I think this has no place in a deep theological discussion, but I beg to differ, sir. When I live off-grid, I can pee wherever I want. Nobody can tell me where I can or can't pee, because there's nobody there. There are still places where I don't pee or shouldn't pee, right? I haul my water up from a creek. I drink out of that creek. I'm not going to pee upstream of where I get my water. Nor would I, as a decent human being, pee upstream of anywhere that anybody downstream of me in that creek is going to drink, reasonably. Somebody could be stumbling through the woods and drink, and I wouldn't know. But I'm not going to pee in a creek in general. I wouldn't do that, right? Nor if there was, like, a group of campers, you know, a mom with a couple of kids, or am I going to just go pee in front of them? Even though though there'd be any law against it in the woods, I wouldn't do that because human decency and morals, right? There's no governing authority to tell me not to do that. It's just the right thing to do. But other than that, I can pretty much pee wherever I want. But there are certain places where I should pee and shouldn't pee. No laws need to be passed for that. Talked about peeing, getting rid of water. Let's talk about getting water. Don't worry, this is going somewhere. When I want water off-grid, I fetch a container. I go down to a creek or a stream. I fill up said container and I haul it back to where I need it. If I want hot water, I have to make a fire and make said water hot. Now, let's talk about going into the city. These are just a few examples. There are probably many, many more, but easy examples. I come into the city. I have to pee. I've been off grid for a while, and I go to pee, and I think I can't just pee wherever I want. Why? Because city. City equals more rules. Instead of me governing where I'm going to pee, right? Also, also always the law of God and what he says. The law of God is not transitory, right? It does not change based on city or country. The law of God is immutable, just like God doesn't change. But there's less freedom in the city. In the country, barring I don't pee in my own water supply, which is a self-correcting problem because I'd get sick, and not exposing myself to somebody that shouldn't see it. I can pretty much pee wherever I want, but not in the city. There's less freedom in the city. I have to pee where I'm told. They have designated places, and there's not no reason for that, right? They have designated places because you have thousands or millions of people in a city. If they all just pee wherever they want, it would be dis- more disgusting and less sanitary than it is, right? So less freedom in cities, and that doesn't just apply to where you pee, right? That could apply to lots of things. What's the flip side to that? When I want water, more convenience. I can just go turn on a tap. If I'm in that bathroom, I can grab a container and go to the sink and have water that's probably not good for me, 
but it's not going to kill me, right? I can just turn on the tap. I have less freedom, but I have more convenience. If I want hot water, I just have to turn a knob. I get hot water. The amount of energy and manpower and time it takes me in the country to produce hot water by myself off a grid in the wilderness, quite a bit. In the city, I can just turn a knob. So I'm giving up freedom for convenience moving to a city. You can argue whether that's good or bad, but I don't think, just like we talked about earlier, liking something or thinking it's good or bad doesn't change the fact that it is. It is that way, right? I'm in the country. I have more freedom. I like to shoot. There's a whole other podcast called Gunfighter Life. Not really germane to except for this point. I'm out in the country, living off grid in the woods, right? I can just shoot. I can set up a shooting range. It's all me. I have my own targets and make my own range and make sure it's safe. Again, I can't just shoot willy-nilly anywhere I want, like across the river where there might be boats or, or anything like that. But I can pretty much shoot the vast majority of places. You try that in a city and you're going to jail, right? There's a, maybe one or two designated places where you can go and pay money and shoot. Much less freedom in where I can shoot. But it's more convenient, right? They have steel targets. They have targets. So we see that again. So we see in cities less individual freedom, but more convenience. Generally in the country, you have to do things for yourself. You have to think about how to get something done or have a system in place and work at it to get it done. Clear example is the water. In the city, it's provided for me. Even I'm not gonna lie, that's way more convenient. If I'm out in the country and I get dirty, I have to go through all the rigmarole to make hot water to jump in a river or a creek. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning and I'm thirsty and I didn't plan ahead and think ahead, I have to go down to a creek and get water at 2 o'clock in the morning. Not super convenient. So we see this trade of you get less freedom, but you get more convenience. Let's just, again, don't take my word for it, but look at that and examine that. I think that's pretty clear. And how does that affect someone growing up in that environment? I don't know. I don't know whether that's good or bad. I'm just submitting a question here. How does this impact the trending of a culture, a society, a people group as a whole? Perhaps it doesn't. Perhaps it very much does. I said I was going to submit some ideas for thought here. Why are people attracted to cities? We talked about that convenience. Let's talk about stuff. Now, almost no stuff originates in cities, right? Originates. Number one, God is the source of all things. God created all matter, all things. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Gospel of John, right? We're talking about raw materials, resources, crops. Those things come from the hinterland. They come from the surrounding countryside. So, although today or in times past you may have a majority of people living in cities the majority of goods and resources originate in the hinterlands in the country so you see this shipping of stuff to the cities and although you may have stuff originating in the country it's probably one or two things for a given area those things are collectively found in cities let's use a classic example in America Pittsburgh steel They're probably not mining much iron ore in the city of Pittsburgh. come from the Appalachian Mountains. There might be a certain spot in those Appalachian Mountains that is really good for producing pig iron, for producing iron ore. It may not be a great source of carbon, which is needed to make steel. That may come from somewhere else. That may come from, let's say, oyster shells in the Mid-Atlantic. They come together in Pittsburgh and get smelted into iron. Pittsburgh steel, right? So all those things don't originate in the cities, they come together in cities. If you want stuff and a multitude of stuff, you go to cities. And the bigger the city, the more stuff you'll generally find there. Let's take a real simple example. Going back to we talked about fruit in the beginning, let's talk about fruit. My wife really likes foraging. It's kind of her way to unwind. She has a master's degree and a big city job. And sometimes when the stress gets a lot, and I've had big city jobs, I get it. We'll go walk around and forage for wild food. 
there are more blackberries here in the Pacific Northwest than I could pick. Like the time, the limit of the amount of berries that we could pick here is limited by the amount of time we have to pick them, not the number of berries, right? Berries in abundance here. So I can just go outside and get berries. That's easier than going to the city and getting berries, right? Because I have to go through a checkout line and pay and all that stuff. Just get berries out here. Now, if I want jam, my wife and I make quite a bit of jam. It's quite labor intensive. I do it because my wife likes to do it. I like spending time with my wife because I love my wife, right? Looking at that honestly, it takes a lot of effort to make jam. If you've ever made jam, you know. It's way easier to drive into town even from a very remote area that I was living in be easier to just go in and buy in the next very small town a couple of jars of jam I can find jam in that small town now let's say another thing made from fruit let's stick with grapes for this analogy let's call you know grape a fruit so if I want grape jelly I go to a small town I can find grape jelly at most rural very small town grocery stores convenience stores I can probably find grape jelly right if I want brandy, I may have to go to a little bit bigger city. Another byproduct, but it takes a little bit more work, a little bit more time. Maybe not going to find brandy in that very small town, like the town I talked about earlier. We could go into town. It was, I think, 3,000 people. I don't know that I'd be able to find brandy there. I have to go into a little bit bigger city. Now, let's say that my wife has a hankering for my wife's not a drunkard or anything. I don't want to give you that idea. But let's say my wife really likes this and she doesn't. But this specific type of brandy, like that's her special treat. She likes, I don't even know what who makes brandy. But we're going to roll with it. We're going to call it Brandy's brand of brandy, right? Brandy makes brandy. It's very high end, very elite. I'm probably not finding that even in that little bit bigger city. I'm going to have to go to a big city to get that even though the original product that you make brandy from the grape is grown in the country i can't get that brand of brandy out on the countryside and those grape vines probably can't make it myself because the area where i'm growing grapes i can't grow refined sugar i could make a still if it were legal and distill brandy or or whatever or made brandy you've made plenty of wine and beer which is legal and giving it away Anyway, I could make it, but let's say that Brandy's Brandy uses vanilla and cinnamon. Well, I can't grow vanilla and cinnamon. I don't know of anywhere in the United States where you can grow vanilla and cinnamon. Maybe they do exist, but they probably don't exist in the same place that I can grow grapes, right? Even if I can go out, there's Oregon wild grapes around, and I can go pick grapes. I'm probably not getting that high-end brandy. I have to go to a city for that. And there's a place for that, right? I told you that I like shooting. I guess it'll come up again in this podcast. I like shooting. I can reload ammo. I have been reloading since I was a very young boy. Probably, honestly, too young to be dealing with molten lead and casting my own lead bullets and things like that and playing with hot molten lead. But I'm very acquainted with the process. I dare say I could even make my own black powder. And if I really, really had to, I can scavenge and probably make ammunition. But if I want, like, good well-made primers with mercury fulminate good reliable kind and i want those kind of supplies i need to go to a city to get those that's you know probably how cities come together and start right jack grows beef jill raises chickens jack's tired of beef and he wants some eggs jill's tired of eggs and wants some beef they go somewhere and meet in a market of sorts exchange goods somebody else sees that and they say hey wait i've got a bunch of grape jelly i'd like to trade for some beef and some eggs and they're like oh i'd like some grape jelly and you have a market it will come together right you have the starts of a town which will grow into a city somebody wants to trade something or do something they'll go to that spot because it's a spot known for doing that and it grows and grows sooner or later there's so much goods and services that you need to build roads to haul them in and out and you see where that goes you see how civilization kind of creates cities there So although the raw materials come from the hinterlands, from the country, they come together in cities. So the cities are supported by the hinterlands. The cities are dependent on rural areas for the raw materials. Cities may make high-end objects. They may turn out, whatever, the automobile. But the raw goods for the automobile almost certainly do not come from that city. 
they are mined or produced or grown in other places, right? Think about how this plays in to our original question. Why are cities liberal? Is it a cause? Is it an effect? Why is it the way that it is? Also, well, we'll save the final thought for the end. If you listen to all this, you may be thinking, I really like this content. You may be thinking, shut up and talk about guns and knives. I want to hear about gear. I want to. I want something I can quickly get a solution to and order on Amazon. Well, don't worry. There'll be more gear shows and gear reviews in the future. So if yeah, that's what you like, there'll be more of that coming. If you did like this content or you didn't like this content, let me know. You can like the podcast, hit some stars on Spotify or iTunes, or you can contact me. If you want to contact me, goodshepherdtraining.com, goodshepherdtraining.com. As a thanks for listening to this episode, I'll throw out a tactical tip. You've listened for quite a long time. I appreciate that. Tactical tip of the day and a thanks to my beautiful, lovely, and multi-talented wife who reminded me of one of our SOPs. As I said, we lived in a big city, especially when I was the commander of a tactical team in a very large city. We had an SOP for getting out of the city. If you don't know, in a lot of big disasters and a lot of big events, comms go down, meaning like cell phones, things like that, because everybody's trying to communicate at once. And the amount of people trying to communicate a lot of times will outweigh the capacity of that system, and the system will go down, meaning you can't call somebody. You may or may not be able to send a text message. Maybe it's down altogether. Maybe there's no comms, no electronics are working at all in a big disaster. Very low tech way. We had the SOP to keep a can of spray paint in our cars. Let's call it tactical tagging, right? She had a very unusual, like, lavender color. Had a very obnoxious green color. Something that you normally wouldn't see. We had designated rally points or waypoints. And we had designated bug out locations. You listen to Bug Out actually, actually did Bug Out. We have Bug Out for real as in addition to a lot of other practice Bug Outs. Anyway, with this tactical tip, the SOP is have you and your loved ones, maybe your group, have spray paint is cheap. A couple of really weird off-the-wall colors. The idea is if you go to a rally point and nobody's there, you at least can leave just a little dot or a little indication that nobody else would know. Like, oh, there's a little lavender dot here. Who cares? Well, I would know that my wife has already been there and moved to the next rally point or tried to make it to our bug out location. If I got to the next location that we had pre-designated and there was nothing there, right, I would know that she hadn't been that far, so it's time to turn around and go look for her. I want to spend time hanging out at the first location if it's not safe and my wife has already moved on from there, right? So I could, you know, let's say make a big stripe of a big green somewhere at you know, a crossroads, that would mean to look for a little bit better detailed information. Piece of right in the rain paper written with instructions or what's going on. Probably not going to see that driving by, but I would see that big green stripe and think, huh, I need to look around her a little bit closer and see. My wife left me a message. Anyway, that's your tactical tip of the day. Remember I said I'd save the last thought for the end? which you know usually means that you get the tactical verse of the day. Think about this. God made man, and he put him in a garden. The first mention of a city in the Bible, I do believe, was made by Cain, the first murderer in the Bible. So God made man and put him in a garden. As far as is recorded in the Bible, Cain, the first murderer, made the first city. Think about that. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bore Enoch. And he built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Anyway, another verse for the day, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
Therefore, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Whether you live in the city or the country, be a child of God and follow God. Thanks for reasoning with me today, men. Thanks and have a blessed day.